from the University of Minnesota, Rochester, so I got no Our Town. Martin Luther King Jr. Day was first celebrated as a federal holiday in January of 1986. Each year, Rochester hosts a series of events on the day, and here to tell us more about what we can expect from this year's community celebration is Barbara Jordan. Welcome to our town. Thank you, Nicole. Can you tell us a little bit about what the program's going to look like on Monday? Well, we have a full slate of activities set for uh, Monday, January 21st. In particular, this year, our programming has been expanded because of a very special renaming ceremony that will take place at East Park. As our community has come together with the agreement of several different groups, including the Eastside Pioneers, Park and Rec, City of Rochester, we will be renaming East Park to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Park. I, I apologize, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Park on Monday afternoon. So it'll be an exciting expansion to our uh, normal programming. So my understanding is that the usual march that happens through downtown will actually be going to East Park. We will, um, and I've talked about contingency plans in case of weather, and our colleagues have said we're going to march. So uh, the PD, the Rochester police, escort us, and if it's, if it's too terribly bad on the roads, I'm sure we'll find an alternative route. But the plan is to march down Center Street the one mile, which should take us about 20 minutes, okay. to East Park. Wonderful. And um, in, the, in terms of the morning's activity, so there will be um, the breakfast that happens annually. Uh, can you tell us some of the highlights? Who are the keynote speakers or, or some of the performers? Yes, um, we will have this year, our keynote speaker will be Dr. Jeffrey Boyd, who, as most people know, is our new president for RCTC. So we're real excited that Dr. Boyd agreed to be our keynote speaker. I think it's kind of a coming out for him. The students, the faculty, and staff at RCTC have come to know Dr. Boyd, and I hear nothing but great things. So we're excited that he will have a chance to meet with a vast number of folks from our community. We expect six to 800 people at the breakfast, which will kick off at 745. Our program will start at 830. And what's the feel for that event? I know in times past, I mean, it's a, that's a huge crowd, 800 people, um, many different mem members of the community. Who else can we expect to see, and, and who's invited to, to be part of this? The whole community is invited, and the, the beauty of the breakfast is that we will have people from every walk of our community. It's a, a wonderful mix that uh, highlights the diversity that is Rochester from our business community. The Chamber is one of the major sponsors to uh, the Diversity Council as a sponsor representing the NAACP's Rochester branch. I'm um, on the planning committee and we are sponsors. So we really try to reach out. Uh, as you know, we'll have some of our medical students there at the event. We'll have, um, because school is out, a lot of K-12 kids and we take time to engage them in sign making for the actual rally in March. Uh, we will have students uh, performing of spoken word and poetry. And then students are also presenting as winners of the Diversity Council's poetry contest. So K-12 uh, will be on the stage. Great youth representation. And every year we really strive to have an opportunity to highlight our young people. So you mentioned some partners of the Diversity Council, the NAACP, uh, the Chamber. Are there any other entities that, that are sponsoring this? The City this of working? Rochester has been a great partner. We've worked with Jenna Bowman and her colleagues to really uh, take advantage of what our city has to offer. The city wants to be a partner, which I think is terrific. And it makes things a lot easier when it comes to marches and permits and, and plotting out uh, the route we'll take to have the police department and all of our city um, officials, the mayor, um, Mayor Brady will actually be highlighting the naming ceremony. Uh, Kim Norton will be there, Mayor Norton will be there uh, to help usher in this new, kind of this new era for East Park as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King yeah. Park. That sounds like such an exciting uh, program. Um, beyond a day off for people, what do you hope people take away from, from this event and, and just the day of Martin Luther King? So, you know, we take time to stop and we talk, you hear often about the dream and the legacy, but our, our afternoon speaker for the community program, who will be attorney Angela Porter, I think her title says it all. Um, the legacy and moving from challenge to action. 
So it's really about how can I, as an individual, be a part of making the legacy come alive? How can we make the dream a reality? The question we ask ourselves over the past you know, several decades, but to think about on an individual basis and on a community basis, how can we ensure that Dr. King's dream stays alive? And that's a very important message. I know I have my, my little rituals that I do on Martin Luther King Day. I listen to some of the old speeches. Those recordings are really powerful to listen to. Um, what does the day mean to you, that, that day of reflection? Very much like you, Nicole. I am a student of um, oral history, and I love listening and reading. I have several anthologies of Dr. King's speeches, and he is my idol and has always been, not only because of the sacrifice and his legacy, but I think he was a terrific writer. Some of my favorite writings are from Dr. King's time that he spent in the Birmingham jail and all of the other speeches um, today because of the internet. There's most of it all is available to us. So I love to just kind of luxuriate in his words and in his message and in his voice. And how can people, RCP, get their tickets, make sure that they're there on Monday morning? Mm -hmm. So for both programs, for the Chamber program, we call it the Chamber program because they are the primary sponsor for the breakfast. Um, go online, rochesterareachamber.com, and uh, you can request or purchase tickets. For the, I call it the People's Program, our commemorative program, there is no cost, no tickets required. We'll be at the Rochester Civic Theater after the return from East Park, beginning at 1230. So we wrap up the day with the Dr. King birthday party there at the Rochester Civic Theater, and that's where our community speaker will be uh, presenting. Great. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, and hopefully some of us will see you on Monday. Absolutely. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Be sure to stick around. We've got some exciting stories coming up next on Our Town. We learn about a historic life-saving guide for black travelers. We get some Tech 101 from the library. And we go behind the scenes for three hots and a cot in this week's Our Culture segment. Twenty years ago, Debbie and I were teaching a theater therapy class at a federal prison. And during that period of time, we workshopped a play with the inmates. Uh, and that play became Three Hots in a Cot. The uh, whole reason that we started doing theater therapy was uh, I was doing my internship in counseling. And uh, I thought, you know, it would be great is if we could teach our uh, students, inmates, vicariously, what are the consequences of their actions, and then maybe we could do it through theater where they try different roles on. And um, Bureau of Prisons <laughs> was, was uh, a little, looking at that a little askance, like, Wait, what are you doing, theater therapy? And so it took me about six months to convince them that this was a good idea. And I think it's still going on now. Like, none of them can make it on the outside. They have a real convict mentality, a lot of them. Hey, Vic! Last year, I found an old copy of the script as I was going through a file cabinet. And I said, wait, we were always going to do this on the outside because we've only done it one time on the inside of the Federal Medical Center. So I called up Theo and said, remember, we were always going to do this show, Three Hot and a Cot, and we thought this is the best time to do it. And um, we thought, you know, we could probably use a little more music because we just had a couple of songs. And so then I kind of sidled up to Greg and said, hey, you want to do a couple of songs? And then you could tell him what it really turned in. So then we started working on the songs and uh, we did a couple, you know, wrote a couple. And uh, I guess you liked them because now there's eight or nine songs in the, sh in the show. Uh, so it really has turned out into a, a, a very for me, a very interesting mix of, of drama and comedy and music and 
even dance, and it's it's, it's very interesting. <laughs> That whole environment behind the razor wire it, uh, is kind of unknown to most of us on the outside. And we heard things that uh, were really compelling and interesting, like that uh, a, a fellow might really miss drinking out of a glass glass, something that I never would have thought of, or driving a car. Obviously, inmates aren't driving cars for years at a time, that you know someone would miss that. I, I just hadn't even thought of that. Um, or I, had a, I heard an overheard a conversation between two inmates one time where they were talking about what kind of soap did they buy at the commissary and whether or not the soap dried out their skin. And these were big, tough looking guys. But that, that attention to those small things because they don't have a lot of choice on the inside uh, was something that really struck both of us and something we wanted to uh, insert in the stories that we told. Three Hats and a Cot is being performed at the Rochester Repertory Theater. It opens January 11th and closes January 27th, so that's three weekends. Uh, there are Thursday performances the middle and last weekend and a Sunday matinee on the 27th. Yeah, the Rep was very welcoming to allow us to bring in a show we've never done outside of prison and do it here at the Rep. And they were, um, very open to having the world premiere of this play, world premiere on the outside, be at their theater. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town, or ksmq.org slash Our Town. For all those women entrepreneurs out there, listen up. The 2019 WE Forum focuses on funding sources and it'll be held on Tuesday, January 22nd from 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. at Cascade Meadow. It's a free event and it's created specifically for women entrepreneurs from across Southeast Minnesota. A select panel of experts in venture capital, angel investing, revenue generation, lending, and grants will share their thoughts. Details at ready.com. And to help you get that new business off the ground, Collider Coworking recently announced the addition of more than more than more workspaces. Sorry, Collider 424 is now open and features individual and co-working spaces. Collider is also hosting the next One Million Cups event for local entrepreneurs at the Blue Duck on Wednesday, February 6th. For more information, visit Collider.mn. And speaking of coffee, if you'd like to have some coffee with a cop, stop by Dunn Brothers Coffee on Elton Hills Drive Northwest between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Tuesday, January 29th to do just that. Mayor Kim Norton and Police Chief Jim Franklin will be there and they hope that you'll stop to talk about anything that's on your mind. For more information, visit facebook.com forward slash Rochester Police Department. And believe it or not, with all the snow on the ground, spring will be here before you know it. And the City of Rochester is now accepting applications for Rain Gardens cost share grants. Seven projects will receive 50% of verifiable costs, up to a maximum of $750 for the creation of a rain garden. Rain gardens are beautiful ways to control runoff in urban landscapes. So those of you with those green thumbs will want to check out the details at rochesterstormwater.com. And the City of Rochester is finishing work on the new parking ramp just off North Broadway. As part of the design, the ramp is capable of supporting 10 stories of additional building above. Developers interested in creating an affordable or mixed income housing development in this space can submit proposals to the city. Parameters for the project will promote the ideals of smart growth and contribute to a walkable downtown. Proposals will be due June 14th and questions should be directed to the Assistant City Administrator, Terry Spaeth, at 507-328-2008. And up next, we drop into the Rochester Public Library to get some tech help from Brian Lind in this week's Walkabout segment.
So what it's going to do now is it's going up and looking at the satellites. Hi, this is Danielle Teal with Our Town Walkabout. I'm in the digital drop-in center, and you are helping this lovely lady out with what exactly? We've had a couple of things today. Okay. We had some issues with the Mac where something was popping up. We turned out it was actually a virus, um, but we found a way to get it off. And we're also working on GPS. Ooh, we all need that. Yes. So we've got new maps in here, so she's going to be good to go when she gets out where she can see the satellites. Outstanding. So this is a great offering at the Rochester Library. What are some popular questions that people ask when they're here? Um, we get lots of questions about photographs, about how to move them from your phone to print them out or move them onto a computer, this or that. Um, lots of questions about uh, emails, about setting things up, lots of questions about searching the internet. Um, pretty much everything and anything. Um, some of which we can handle very well, some of which are a little bit beyond our pay grade. What's the most difficult question? Um, fix my computer. Oh, sure. <laughs> I bet you get asked that a lot. Don't well, you? not that often, oh, okay. but sometimes. Okay. Actually, one time I had somebody who came in who wanted us to fix her printer, and she brought her printer in. That's outstanding. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't do anything right. with that. But but no, we get, we do the best we can with what we get, and, and generally we're able to help folks out, or at least point them to resources if, if it's beyond what we can do. Now, do you feel like you got all your answers? Oh, from oh I've been coming here for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, so you're a repeat yeah, customer. I'm always, I'm a repeat <laughs> customer. And um, yes, I've always gotten my questions answered. Always. Yeah, bring your gadgets, and we will do our best to get your home. And how often is this open during the day? Um, it is for the digital drop-in. It is open um, Mondays from 9:30 to 11, Tuesdays and Thursdays 1 to 2:30, and on Wednesday afternoons 3 to 5. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. On the tree swinging, I'm a loser that just can't stop winning. On stage, I'm there for the loving. You can see it in my face, I'm singing. This man is. So you might have heard the name Green Book a lot lately because of the Golden Globe winning film of the same name starring Mahershala Ali and Viggo Mortensen. But for many African Americans growing up in the first half of the 20th century, the Green Book was a life-saving guidebook for traveling across the United States. The History Center of Olmsted County will be opening an exhibition in February charting the history of the Green Book and a Rochester site that made its way into its pages. Here to tell us more is Patricia Carlson, Executive Director of the History Center of Olmsted County, and George Thompson, a community and civil rights leader and contributor to the exhibit. Welcome to our town. Thank you. So you have a lot to share with us about the history, your own personal reflections on the history of the Green Book. But can we start by just talking a little bit about what the Green Book was? The Green Book was initially put together by a postman in New York City who um, prepared information so that people, African American people or black people could ha have an idea of where they can go for uh, stop for gas, to stop to use a restroom, to use the laboratories because back in those days in the 50s through 60s it wasn't always a good idea to have a mechanical problem on a highway. It was really an issue of safety for many of the families who were going there. And especially if the family was of mixed race, it was even more threatening to try and find somewhere to stay that would accept you or that wouldn't threaten you. So we're talking about the segregation era, some of these mm -hmm. laws that were uh, mandated segregation in a lot of Jim states Crow and Jim Crow laws in the, in the yes. South and, and did make their way up to some of the northern and western and eastern states as well. Um, Patricia, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what inspired the, the History Center to take this on as, a, as an exhibition, as a project? Well, we've been looking for something that will expand our history beyond white European history and American history uh, of those groups. And uh, a friend came to us via the Minnesota's uh, Automotive Museum, which is in infancy, and said, here's a book, Ruth and the Green Book about a young woman and her family traveling south to visit grandma. And in one of the sections of the book, an ESO station attendant who is black gives his black family the green book to help them find their way and to stay safe while they're traveling. And they thought that that would be a good premise for us to build an exhibit around to help the community understand some of the things that George talked about, about traveling during that time. And um, before we get to some of the Rochester here, I wanted to ask George, do you have any memories of using this Green Book um, oh, growing absolutely. up? Absolutely. To use the Green Book per se, we knew about some things in terms of the Green Book. You needed to know where you could go, but a lot of that was conveyed to us also through our families. 
our families in the area and in the specific area we'd be traveling to. But it was very, very necessary to know where you can go to get gas and use the restroom to do things that are that could, if if in the in the wrong circumstances, be a very embarrassing situation, or it could be very harmful to your family. And we have um, a site here in Rochester that was part of that Green Book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the Avalon Hotel was purchased by Vernon Manning in 1944. He had come with his wife for her to see um, doctors at Mayo Clinic and it ended up being a long stay. There was no place for them to stay, so he bought the hotel. It, it turned in to be the premier place in Rochester for black folks to stay. Uh, people like... Um, Duke Ellington stayed there. I'm, I can't remember all of the Louis others, Armstrong but Louis Armstrong, one. right? Nat yeah, King Cole, I think. Nat King Cole. Cole. Yeah, it it was a uh, it was a place for folks to get together, feel safe, and feel comfortable. And uh, in and that um, was there anything that surprised you about the history? Things that you learned about the role that the hotel had in this community for so many years? Well, I think what surprised me as a white individual was that it was almost the singular place where people could go. There was nothing else, and that uh, this family was so welcoming of folks from other places. They also accepted white uh, tenants in the rooms. And um, I, I was doing some, some reading as well, and mm -hmm. um, it, it looks like, so in 1963, Martin Luther King came to Minnesota, um, but in 1963, there was also a march um, in solidarity with the Avalon. Do you have any information about that? No, I don't. I came here in 1968, a couple of years later. I was not, but I, I did some research once with the Diversity Council project, and we, obviously we had folks who were there in March, but there was a counter reaction, which was not quite what was expected, and that eggs were thrown and a variety of things. So, um, but, um, but the folks that were, were there, I, I would say, uh, um, Manning family are aware of the project now. Want their grandson is working with us and providing a lot of additional information to give it a little bit or a lot more um, uh, uh, impetus and emphasis. We're uh, so we're we're excited about being able to participate. And frankly, I have to say that the um, History Center is doing a fantastic job of looking up things and preparing things and. I think we're going to have an outstanding exhibit. So what can people expect? Uh, what, what, what will people see when they go into this exhibit when it uh, opens in, in February? Well, you know, obviously history centers have story panels that are there, and those will be there along with artifacts that we've been able to find or develop or borrow. So one room will be around, based around Ruth and the Green Book and the Green Book itself, and to also talk about some of the more specific pieces of what some of the residents of Rochester experienced during that time that we learned during oral histories. We'll have another room that is dedicated to the Avalon Hotel and how that was set up and a history of it. And we're still hoping to get a few more artifacts from the family. And then later on in the month, we'll do a traveling in the 50s to show how doubly difficult it was for all Americans and black Americans in particular because of the condition of the cars and the roads and the tires and so forth. So how long will the exhibit be up? Well, we hope it will be up for at least six months. And uh, the Green Book, I, I know that it, it stopped being published in the late mm -hmm. 60s. Um, and, and Victor Green, the founder, said that he was, would hope that th there would no, no longer be a need for a book of this kind. Um, how do you hope people kind of reflect on, on the Green Book's legacy and, and the need for support continuing today? Wow. Um, we're going to have a place so, so that people can drop in some information, you know, write, write a note about what they experienced as they saw that. We would like people to be aware that life is tough or ha was very tough for those individuals, things that we might not have recognized living in a white world that, were, um, that still continue today to some extent, that, that the Civil Rights Act didn't solve the whole problem. Um, I think also it's, it's helpful also to get some additional education about the uh, history of what has happened and what is actually the truth of what the environment and the period was like. So seeing the video or the film, the Green Book, 
is an excellent way to spend two hours and learn quite a bit about the history for of at least 40 years. And I think that's still playing in theaters mm -hmm. or it soon will be out and, yes. um, and then people can go and see this exhibit in February and get some more education. Um, and you'll be having uh, oral histories as well, you said, so there'll be video and, and, mm -hmm. and text that people can read. And we'll also have um, copies for sale of replicas or facsimiles of the Green Books from 1949 through 1963. And some of them will actually have the Avalon in them under Rochester. They will Rochester. have the Avalon in there, and they'll, each succeeding one has a few more stories about the previous books and use of it. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for um, having us. We, we, uh, we wish you a lot of luck with your exhibition. Thank you for joining us on Our Town. Uh, we hope that you'll catch um, the events on Monday of Martin Luther King Jr. Day and uh, take a look at that exhibit uh, when it opens up um, in February. But we'll see you next week from the Minnesota, from the University of Minnesota, Rochester. This is Our Town, the show about Rochester. In addition to the exhibit at the History Center of Olmsted County, you can also learn more about the Avalon Hotel by watching an episode of KSMQ's Off 90 from Season 3. Look for the link at ksmq.org slash ourtown.